Welcome to the Expanding Consciousness Podcast with your hosts, Michael Wally and Nicholas Hart. In this podcast, we explore ways to sharpen our awareness, make life more enjoyable, be a little kinder, become more authentic, less reactive, more present, and ultimately expand our consciousness. We're happy to have you along for the ride. And if you do enjoy these conversations, please leave a review or a comment as this goes a long way for us. Enough of the promotional talk and enjoy this episode. The podcast today, we're talking about nootropics, uh, smart drugs, and, and maybe a little bit of biohacking. So I'll refer to you, Nick, on most of this, since it sounds like you have a lot more experience. Um, what are nootropics? Generally, we talk about nootropics as smart drugs or um, mind-enhancing drugs, brain-enhancing drugs. So any kind of supplement, um, I don't know, a drug, um, ingredient um, that enhances brain functionality, which is still a bit vague. But this is um, so it's it's referring to compounds that are supposed to be mind-altering and should help us with a certain type of brain activity. Um, most commonly, people seem to look for drugs that help them with concentration and deep work. Like this is, um, I, I think, yeah, the, the most common use case. And um, there is many compounds uh, out there, you know, from very researched and really old ones that come, uh, you know, that are even known in, I don't know, TCM for thousands of years to really new ones, unresearched ones, even unregulated ones. Um, people are really willing to go, you know, very far and even, you know, try these untested compounds, or maybe they have been only tested in uh, in animals um, to yeah get that brain enhancing effect. Um, I, I've tried a couple of, of those uh, categories and today maybe we can try to create an overview and then share a bit about our experience with some of these substances. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. So I have just, I've dabbled a little bit and certainly over the years I've, I've taken various supplements um, to, you know, fairly subtle effect, I would say. I've uh, done, done some micro dosing that, that might also kind of fit under this topic. Um, I, I, so doing a little bit of research beforehand came across some uh, some things put under the, the topic of nootropic that I, I didn't necessarily know would be considered that, like like caffeine, for example. I think we've all certainly used caffeine from, from time to time. I know that I've used it a lot with work, probably more than <laughs> more than is healthy at times, you know, giving myself a, a few headaches here and there. Um, but what, what have you tried? What have you used? Um, I mean, obviously also... Uh, caffeine. I, I think it's fair to say that I'm uh, addicted to caffeine, at least in terms of work. And uh, it's cool that you bring up caffeine in the beginning because caffeine seems to be like the OG nootropic um, that has been around for hundreds of years. And um, maybe interesting point to make here, uh, not my point, but one from Michael Pollan, um, who wrote a book, a famous book about psychedelics, but he also wrote uh, Your Mind on Plants. And one of the three plants he discusses there is caffeine. And specifically, not only how caffeine influences um, your mind, but also how it influences the mind of society, so to speak. So because uh, caffeine, uh, like the rise of caffeine or coffee, coincided kind of with the um, Industrial Revolution. And I think it's this, this tool which enabled the middle class of today's society to kind of become this efficient workforce that it is. I mean, I certainly uh, use it also uh, in that way. For example, you know, in the morning when switching my mind from my, I don't know, sleepy brain into work mode. I mean, it's so effective uh, in, in changing your, your mind state and bringing you immediately in that like focus state. Okay, now I'm, now I'm ready to work. So in that sense, it's it's really working, and it's a really good example of of an nootropic. And um, he also argues uh, in there that um, it also changes social interactions. I mean, 
right? The meeting places in a site, they are like cafes, tea places, all the places where, where like caffeine is consumed. So it's also has a central role in how we um, interact with each other and kind of with the with the desired state that we want to interact with each other. You know, it's like you don't maybe uh, drink that many coffees a day. You save them for social interactions or work. Yeah, yeah, well, I definitely see that. I, I think any time I've, I've taken much caffeine was always in relationship to work and, and trying to get myself to, to focus more and be a little bit more productive overall. Um, so, so what are some of the other nootropics that that you've experimented with that maybe found more effective or less effective? You know, if I were gonna start myself, you know, what what would you recommend? What would I recommend? Ooh. It depends, kind of, uh, what you what you want to uh, achieve. But I think that there's some broad categories that um, we maybe we can we can cover for people to understand what certain substances could be useful for. And um, yeah, maybe starting with stimulants, um, where it's kind of clear, right? So if you have to get a lot of work done, maybe a stimulant could be something that can help you concentrate, especially concentrate for longer periods of time. Um, so for example, people that have problems with concentration, uh, namely, especially people, for example, that have ADHD, um, they are prescribed um, Adderall, which falls under like stimulants, um, and it, and it's kind of clear in in what way uh, it can help them. But of course, it can also help healthy people if you know if they have uh, long work bouts that they need to get done. Then maybe you would go for um, for stimulant. And and in this category are the rust thumbs, uh, with which I don't have um, experience because they are you, you need to get a prescription in Europe for them. So you know I haven't get got around that. Uh, yet to try them, although it would be interesting. Um, there's also uh, one of the very famous ones is modafinil, or I think in the US it's called Pro Provigil. Um, Tim Ferriss promoted uh, this one, like other big names in the, in the biohacking scene. And um, this compound uh, is actually, like they talk about it, like uh, being the real life limitless pill. Hmm. Wow. Right, there was this this movie about there's a pill where you can start to use 100% of your brain capacity, and people compare it to that. And you know, uh, when people speak about it like that, obviously it's interesting. You know, you want to try, you want to see, like, okay, what's that effect that people talk about? And interestingly enough, modafinil is actually um, a medication for narcolepsy. So for people that have you know that fall asleep randomly during the day and really have problems staying awake. And they use that, um, and I can confirm that uh, it's really, you know, it makes you awake, like really awake, um, but not in a um, in a overstimulated or bad way as amphetamines or speed would do. It's um, it's really just makes you awake. So in that sense, it can be useful, you know, if your concentration is already low and you uh, you want to do some learning or get some work done. Uh, or if you want to pull an all-nighter, probably you know this is the um, the the pill to 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 take for that. Um, for me personally, I don't have that many use cases uh, for it because I don't think it necessarily like enhances any of your cognitive functioning. It's not that you, I didn't feel at least like I've become smarter when taking that, like suggested with when naming it a, like a limitless pill. However, there's like one use case where it's really useful, and that is um, long road trips, like. Um, before I, I used to have this long drive of 15 hours from uh, the top of Germany until Croatia to visit my family often. And for that, it's absolutely amazing. Um, you really stay uh, awake and focused and, um, you know, you can drive for like 10 hours straight, uh, without a problem. Hmm. Interesting. Sounds kind of like a, a good one for truckers, maybe. Uh, did you so did you take it for any extended period of time or did you use it more like as a one off? I'm I'm going to take one of these to make the drive or. Um, no, just just as a, a one one off things, because um, in this very stimulated uh, uh, mind state, I at me, me personally, I didn't feel like, you know, this is a mind state I want to be all the time. I don't know when hanging with my family, with my wife or so on. You don't always want to be that stimulated. 
So it's it's really one of those um, which feels like a useful tool because you know maybe you, if you had some sleepless nights, but there's an important work project you need to get done. Uh, I think there's moments where this thing can be really useful, but anything that stimulates you that much, you know, I, I think there there's no such thing as free lunch for your body in terms of like you know that much wakefulness. So. I can imagine you would pay a price if you would take that every day. You know, maybe you would have some side effects. Um, I personally wouldn't do it. Maybe people have done it. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So what? Uh, what else? What are there any particular nootropics that you found super effective that you would take every day, or that that you do currently? Um, they are actually, and uh, so this, yeah, maybe that's something I can really recommend. Uh, more lightly to to everybody uh, at least to look into it and this is um, adaptogens um, kind of a category of of compounds usually based on extracts of, of plants um, which help you uh, to say it in a very simple uh, form deal better with stress um, that's also why they're called adaptogens because they um, help the nervous system adapt uh, to stress or improve the, the stress response and they are uh, really interesting because unlike all the other compounds which uh, change your state of mind where you would uh, use a compound to reproduce a certain state right so for example with modafinil you want to become very awake uh, with i don't know cbd you want to reliably calm your nervous system down these don't either calm or stimulate you but they kind of provide to the body whatever it needs and correct um, an over overworking nervous system, for example, or a nervous system which is not stimulated enough, which sounds really like, how, how does that work? But um, from what I understand, um, it, it works in, it kind of helps the body buffer cortisol. So cortisol seems to be the thing that throws your nervous system out of balance uh, when faced with stress uh, and which then leads to more side effects if you produce too much cortisol and it seems that these compounds just yeah make the body deal better um, with this amount or maybe down regulates um, cortisol i'm not sure but uh, maybe i can speak better about the uh, about the felt effects of it than like how it actually works and I can say that, um, so I tried out uh, ashwagandha, which um, has a long tradition in India. And then there's rhodiola and ginseng, which have a long tradition in China. Uh, those seem to have a very similar uh, effect for me. There's also cordyceps and chaga, which are actually mushrooms, but are also adaptogens and work very similarly. And the effect is basically that you feel much calmer and i think so when, when i first started using them uh, i started using them in a time where i was really stressed and i could really feel a difference when using them so in a situation that would trigger me i was able to approach it a, a, in a more calmer way and you know having that positive experience i said okay uh, i'm definitely gonna keep using them so i don't use them every every day but as soon as I have a period in my life where, you know, there's more stress, I usually tend to add it to my daily stack of, of supplements, just some shraganda, ginseng. It's always a good measure. Cool, cool. Yeah, sounds like some pretty good ones. Out, out of curiosity, do you notice any sort of effects when you're not taking them? So if you've taken them for, for maybe a week or something and then you stop taking them, do you notice any sort of side effects from that? No, I'd say my answer is no, because I remember in the beginning, there was kind of a, a, a concern for me because I was really, because I, I liked the effect so much that I was really taking them daily. Uh, and I think when, when I was pushing it like that, I I think after some time, maybe the effect was not uh, as strong anymore. So anyways, that led me to using them maybe every couple of days or every second day or something like that, because obviously, you know, you don't want it. Um, you want to be able to keep using the uh, the effects but i also on the other hand did not have any like withdrawal symptoms or anything like that so they don't seem to be 
problematic uh, in that sense, like like other substances. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So that's probably a, a really good place to start if you're just kind of getting into nootropics. You know, uh, play around with some of the adaptogens, see see how they work out for you, for sure. Yeah. So so you did you did mention uh, cordyceps and and chaga? You know, which you mentioned are, are mushrooms, right? So I, I know that you also kind of wanted to get around to talking about Amanita muscaria, which is a very interesting topic just in general. So uh, yeah, lay that on us. Uh, yeah. So one um, one one other category would be uh, that is often mentioned under the tropics umbrella is of course microdosing. Because people do use psychedelics also to uh, enhance their performance, to become more productive. Um, generally, for anybody that never heard of, of microdosing, the idea would be to take a psychedelic uh, in a dose that is below the threshold of being psychoactive or psychotropic, but still having an effect either on the body, or on the nervous system, or perhaps on the subconscious mind. And people swear on microdosing and um, how it can help, for example, with depression, but also productivity. And um, one that is gaining popularity just in the last couple of years is Amanita muscaria, or commonly known as flying agaric, um, for which I always thought, like this is the, um, I think every child knows that this should be a toxic uh, mushroom, right? I mean, it's the one portrayed like in child's books, and I always thought that it's um, that it's toxic and that it cannot be consumed. And only recently learned that this is not the case. Um, it is at high doses a deliriant, and it is uh, it can be toxic in very high doses. But I think the lethal dose for metamascaria is so extremely high um, that I'm not sure if we can really call it um, um, toxic or poisonous in that sense. So, some of what I've read around that is that the toxicity would depend on the way that you prepare it. Like it, you, you need to cook it or you need to, you know, uh, on the more extreme end, potentially like pass it through a, a creature's system, perhaps, right? And and harvest the, the on the, the urinary side um, from, from what I've understood. What, uh, can you add a little bit more details to that? Add a little bit more maybe practical knowledge than my just, uh, dabbling yeah luckily i don't have practical uh, knowledge uh, in in that type of usage yeah that, that's something interesting with uh, amanita muscaria so there are many psychoactive compounds uh, in amanita muscaria and in different like varieties that, that grow um, around the world and also what is interesting is that uh, this is something or this mushroom is one that you cannot really lab grow so it's only growing in the wild you cannot cultivate it like there has been no recorded a history of, of cultivation of Manita muscaria. Maybe we'll get there. So far, everything is like wildly uh, grown and picked. And um, the the most prominent psychoactive compounds are muscimol and ipotenic acid. Uh, so the amount in which they appear in there varies completely. So it can be that one time you eat Manita muscaria uh, and it's, it has very mild effect and the next one is completely deliriant for you because it has a different relationship of those um, compounds in there. And what, what is important to know for these uh, compounds, what people have learned, don't ask me how, but the body does not break these two down. So that means once they pass through your system and you having the psychoactive effect, you pee them out, theoretically, um, they are still there in the amount of uh, in a certain amount in your pee, and they are still psychoactive. So, for anybody to consume your urine, they could still trip afterwards from from uh, you know from that ibotenic acid and muscimo. And apparently, that's how it has been done historically. Like there's stories that in shamanic use that the shamans would eat the mushrooms, and if there hasn't been many amanita around, the people then afterwards would drink the urine from the shamans to also trip. Um, I haven't uh, tried it, but you know, scientifically, it is possible. <laughs> yeah, yeah, very, very interesting. So, do people like microdose Amanita muscaria? Or I, I noticed you, you brought up microdosing, and then you went to Amanita muscaria. Do people microdose it? Have you microdosed it? Yeah, that's actually the um, uh, my preferable uh, way to take it. I, I haven't. Ex 
experimented with that many high doses. Like I think the, the highest I went was maybe like five grams. And uh, a microdose I typically use is 500 milligrams of dried Amentia muscaria. Again, it's different with wet ones or tea, um, but I use the dried ones. And um, it's really interesting because from the experience with psychedelics, although uh, psychedelics seem to be like very different from each other and the uh, experience can be wildly different so much that we that we sometimes think like how are these two substances even in the same category because they produce so wildly different effects and nevertheless what they all seem to have in common is that at high doses they break down your ego and you kind of you know transcend your ego and have a, a non-ego experience however from the reports of Aminta Muscaria, what we know is that kind of the opposite happened. So you do have some delirium psychedelic effects, but it pushes you even more into your persona. Um, uh, and at high doses, that could be perhaps dangerous because you, you could become manic, right? So you could, uh, I don't know, People report that usually when they take high doses, you know, stuff starts to feel silly to them and they are really, they really have a lot of courage. So for example, I don't know, they realize that they, you know, clothes is a, seems to like be like a weird concept Then you know, why are we wearing clothes? What the fuck? I'm just going to take off my clothes and run around in the city and, you know, be in that sense manic or uh, delirium and in that sense also lose control because it gives you too much courage so in that sense i think it can also be dangerous at high doses and you know people report doing crazy shit on, on high doses of uh, amelita muscaria but the effect nevertheless is interesting you know having a psychedelic which has kind of the opposite effect of of all the psychedelics that we know pushing you more into your persona and into your ego and while i think there is a place for um ego crushing substances and i think it's good practice from time to time you know to humble yourself you know let your ego break away and and then put the pieces together after the psychedelic experience i i think it's a very important tool to have i also think it's cool to have a tool that pushes you a little bit uh, in in the ego on the other hand and um, especially in microdosing for me it has been very reliably producing that effect, which means, for example, if I have um, anything coming up that discourages me usually, or that would give me too high uh, or unreasonable amounts of uh, anxiety, I don't know, work presentations or public speaking, speaking engagements, things like that, just 500 milligrams of, of Mita Muscara will usually put me in a much more comfortable place. And I, I'm just going to feel better about myself. I'm not going to question my actions that much unnecessarily much uh, which is at least my tendency sometimes to do uh, before these events so in that sense it's really one of the best nootropics I, I i found and it reproducibly always puts me in a more courageous space so to speak oh very interesting you know i, I think that you can actually I, I mean i think it's legal certainly in the united states i don't know about in europe um and i think in a lot of cases there are a number of companies or advertisements I've come across where they're kind of advertising microdosing mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And I think they actually use Amanita muscaria. They don't always, you know, men mention it. You know, I, I think they kind of want to capitalize on on the, you know, more psychedelic mushrooms and, and interest in that, right? But, but I think, you know, given that Amanita muscaria is legal, I, I, you actually end up finding that in, in some microdosing. And I thought, you know, oh, that's probably just, you know, worthless, but it's very interesting to hear your perspective on it because I've never tried it. So I'd, I'd probably give it a try. Uh, I've, I've microdosed, um, you know, psychedelic mushrooms, uh, psilocybin, right? And found that to be, um, it definitely, I would say it increases your acuity, mm -hmm. you know, some of your perceptual acuity, and it can also increase your ability to think kind of more creatively, more laterally and, and not quite so linearly. Um, at least that's been my experience of it. Have you dabbled with, with microdosing like psilocybin as well? Um, I have, uh, although to be fair, I have been more successful with microdosing uh, LSD, but just because uh, that compound is, is a compound where I'm in general a bit more 
uh, relaxed with. And I do agree with, with your findings. Also, more pro-socially, I feel more pro-social, hmm. uh, have more fun engaging with other people sometimes when, when micro-dosing. Um, so, yeah, overall, positive uh, experiences. But then again, you know, for example, for some reason, um, I would never use a psychedelic microdose before work, you know, kind of combine it with, with hmm. deep work or programming or any kind of work engagement. Somehow these two things don't go uh, together. So it doesn't really increase my productivity. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I can see that. Yeah, very interesting. Um, so kind of back to just nootropics in general, there are so many out there and so, so many different molecules. I mean, I was just reading through a, a list, you know, claimed to be fairly comprehensive and, and there's just so much out there. Like, how do you know where to start is, you know, and, and with some of them kind of being supplements or, you know, working on, on nutrients in your body, for example, like vitamins, do you think getting something like nutrient testing is potentially valuable to kind of get like a baseline before you start? Uh, taking nootropics or have you, have you done anything like that out of curiosity? I haven't. So yeah, you're right. So foods or, or nutrients supplements also actually fall under the umbrella of nootropics because they also produce or they can Im improve your, your brain's functioning, especially if your, uh, if your brain functioning was not right before. So first of all, for people who experience negative symptoms so it would not necessarily look to enhance their i don't know mind state but we experience negative symptoms like brain fog i don't know too much anxiety and so on it's probably a good idea to um, get tested uh, for any deficiencies for uh, these uh, compounds to be supplemented vitamins um, and so on in that case uh, it probably makes sense but other than that, yeah, it depends. Uh, it depends what you what you wanna what you want to get. I mean, there's what is also another ca category which is interesting uh, for nootropics is the ones that either attack or mimic neurotransmitters because they are they're kind of then copying the the body's mechanism or optimizing the the body's mechanism in place. Um, what I mean by that is, for example, if we take GABA. GABA is the neurotransmitter that is responsible for the high that you get from, from alcohol, for example, or rather the relaxation and the parasympathetic response that you, the drowsiness that you get from, from alcohol. And you can actually buy GABA, like the neurotransmitter itself. And apparently, you know, it also passes the, the blood brain barrier and, um, it produces an effect similar to alcohol. Another one is Fenibut, which is very popular in Russia. Um, I think also prescription medication, at least in Germany, so difficult to get. But it produces very similar effects like alcohol, but impairing your motor skills less, you know, so you, you don't get that negative effects like, um, like alcohol. Then there's uh, Kratom or Kratom, how it's called uh, in Southeast Asia, which uh, works on the um, on the receptors of uh, what is the what is the class of, of, of compounds uh, called? I think they're the opioid receptors. Right. So um, yeah. it actually applies on on the same receptors where opioids hit, for example, Xanax and, and these kind of medications. However, this uh, the benefit of kratom at least is you know this is a natural plant or rather an extract of a plant that you take. And there's uh, many different kinds that work either stimulating or calming. And uh, it has been a good replacement for people that want to get off of drugs to replace it with Kratom usage. However, I read a lot of reports that Kratom or Kratom is really addictive, that people get hooked on it mm. and withdrawal of it is really nasty. So that's maybe a, a good point to kind of push in a disclaimer that uh, if, I mean, I'm all for exploring expanded states of awareness, change states of mind, um, using that to your benefit. I'm all for it. I play around with these compounds. But people have to be aware that 
at the end of the day, these are drugs that change your mind, that potentially change your body, and that also potentially are addictive or harmful. You know, so it's easier to go with the already by the FDA regulated medications or supplements where you're sure, okay, there's like scientific research uh, behind it and we know how much uh, addictive potential it has or not. And for those more adventurous ones, you know, go order some Russian drugs where there's literally research uh, in humans or try to eat Kratom for one month straight and see if you're going to get addicted. Um, yeah, I think there's there's something for, for everybody. Yeah, definitely. I've I've uh, dabbled a little bit with with kratom as well, uh, fairly on on the low end, and and found it you know kind of mild, uh, somewhat similar effects to to cannabis for me. Um, you know, just really helped me relax in in general. Um, was wasn't super appealing to me, but like yourself, I also came across a decent amount of reports on Reddit in particular. Of, of people who, you know, got, got fairly addicted and going through withdrawal and maybe experiencing like seizures or, or some other pretty nasty side effects. So definitely one uh, to, to be careful with. Honestly, with any of these things, I, I think there's a question of like, um, if you're taking it in a more refined form versus taking it in more like a whole food kind of form, right? If you're taking extracts or something, it's gonna be, you know, orders of magnitude more potent than taking the whole food. And there are going to be, you know, more, it's going to be easier to become addicted to that and potentially experience side effects. I think when you're taking things in more of a whole food form, there tends to be um, other compounds within the whole food that, that might uh, help buffer some of the effects and, and not make it quite as in, intense just in general. Also, your body is not used to uh, getting you know the extracts uh, in nature so now that you offer it to your body and if, if it's a if it's you know like something that produces a nice effect obviously your body is going to start craving it. it's going to go crazy because it never gets it from natural compounds and it's sure as hell going to give you like lots of dopamine for for taking it and i think that's where where some of the addictiveness comes from yeah yeah totally makes sense um so what uh, can you tell us much about stacks? So my understanding of stacks is basically like like I mentioned, there are just so many different nootropics out there that that work in uh, you know various different ways. And so you potentially reach a point where you want to start combining some of these to greater effect. And I think that's that's where stacks come in. They're just combinations of some of these nootropics. Do you take a particular stack or have you you dabbled with stacking nootropics? A little bit. Um, so yeah, stacks is kind of the advanced uh, usage where you um, you you you've done trying compounds in isolation and you found what's good for you and then you try to kind of create your own stack and then when you stack compounds up, perhaps that would even change uh, you know kind of create a new combined effect. And I know that people are experimenting with this a lot, but. You know, then it becomes kind of uh, less and less reliable because, you know, there's obviously we are happy if we find good research on one of these compounds. Rarely is there one where they research these compounds uh, in combination. Nevertheless, that doesn't stop companies to experiment and try to find the, um, their own combination and, and sell them as stacks because um, especially with with these natural compounds, you cannot, I think, make so much money like with ashwagandha and so on because it's a plant and everybody can grow it, right? It's not difficult to make. Right, right. So to get the competitive edge and the advantage, companies try to come up with these stacks where, I don't know, a combination of this adaptogen with this stimulant will, um, will create um, these even more uh, intense effects and then they're going to brain it uh, a certain way. Uh, the w one that I've tried... Uh, that I'm uh, using uh, recently is uh, Alpha Brain from Onnit, and uh, I mean it has really good compounds. So it combines uh, L-tyrosine and Alpha GPC, which are really well researched and known to promote concentration. And uh, along that, it has also some adaptogens. 
Um, I think they probably don't even list like the, the full list of compounds because otherwise other brands could, could copy it. Um, so this is one of the so one of the more known stacks. So it's, it's just a stack in, in in one pill, and I gotta say it's working really well. But mm. obviously there there's also always the problem of placebo effect. You know it could be also a placebo effect, but I mean at the end of the day I, I don't even mind, right? Because if it's creating the effect for you. Um, well enough. So I don't, I haven't gone that advanced that I started like stacking stuff for myself, but I, I'd rather than go for a brand. And if it's a big brand, at least, you know, you're going to have lots of reviews. And if there's like thousands, thousands of reviews saying, yeah, okay, this stuff works, then um, yeah, it's easier for me to to stack that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that brings up a couple of interesting topics. One being like, how do we know if these things are working? Obviously, I mean, with something like, say, drinking caffeine, it, it, it's pretty obvious the the stimulant effects. But I, I think a lot of the uh, a lot of times the effects can be much more subtle. So, I mean, do you personally do something to measure it? Do you like take in a some sort of uh, IQ test or something before you start taking the drug, and then take one, you know, midway through? Is there anything you do to measure it, or is it more just subjective? Ooh, good question. So no, I'm not that scientific that I'm going to do really uh, some some measures. Uh, honestly, what when I start out for nootropics or looking into them, the desired effect I was looking for was anyways, maybe uh, improved mood. So things that can uh, enhance my mood. And that is anyways difficult to measure. I mean, I guess you could log your mood yeah. daily and see like if there's an improvement over time, but never cared enough to be that scientific about it. But I kind of trust my own experience of these these compounds well enough yeah. to um, to say if I want to keep using them or not. But it does open the interesting question of um, yeah, the placebo effect, how that works. But again, I mean, if if I'm able to create the desired effect with a placebo that, for example, um, a nootropic offers, I mean, even better so. That means like I have the skill to reproduce or to change my mind state at will, um, even though I would perhaps be cheating myself because I'm thinking that the substance does it, although I'm doing it. But at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. I mean, it's cool. I'm able to change my state of being at will, so even better. Yeah. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, the other the other thought that that kind of brought up was, hmm, have you stopped taking it at any point and noticed any sort of downsides, any sort of withdrawal effects, or have you just uh, taken it pretty consistently? Which one? Uh, the the alpha brain. Oh, um, no. So I yeah, maybe maybe I shouldn't speak in too much detail because I haven't tried it for 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 that long. Um, but I've I've just taken it here and there, maybe every second or third day, and so far it has been always consistent. Mm -hmm. um, there's no tolerance build up yet, and no withdrawal effect. It's also not that it's uh, like a mindset I'm, I'm necessarily craving always. So I'm like, oh my god, I want to do it every day. So with that one, I, I really got to say no negative side effects. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I guess some of my questions around like mm, potential downsides is say like, for example, with an SSRI or something, your body eventually, you know, uh, kind of downregulates and, and stops creating as much serotonin because it's it's not getting uh, re reuptake, right? It's not getting recycled as, as much, uh, probably not quite speaking to that properly. But in any case, essentially your body adapts and, and stops producing as much um, endogenous versions of, of, say, like these neurotransmitters. Do you think that that's a potential downside where your body almost becomes reliant on, on some of these supplements? Yeah, definitely. So especially if we're talking about hormones. So um, what is the what is the one for downregulating sleep? Melatonin. Exactly. Melatonin is um, taken exogenously. Um, I know that's very popular. I'm not sure, like, 
So it's, it's, for me, it just seems logical. I don't have any personal experience of taking exogenous hormones and then, you know, my body down regulating, but it just seems logical that this needs to be what is happening. So I would recommend, for example, vitamin D is also a, a hormone. And it seems to me a little bit strange that vitamin D is recommended that widely because, you know, I, I think it implies that your body will definitely be down-regulating it and producing it less on its own. However, so far there has been no research saying that, you know, we should stop taking vitamin D because of that. I also haven't seen any substantial research around melatonin. I mean, I know it wouldn't also be in interest of all of these companies that are like selling melatonin like like crazy at the moment for research like this to to appear. It seems very logical. I don't have personal experience with it, but I think um, just in general, it would be a good idea that if you take a certain stack for, for longer periods, that means like for a month, for example, to have breaks in between and and try to see if you have any negative side effects, if you have withdrawal effects, because I think that is exactly the mechanism behind negative withdrawal effect is, is exactly this, your body down-regulating and adapting and now expecting the substance, not getting it produced negative experiences. Right, right. So maybe that brings us to a, a good topic around like so many of these, uh, these molecules that we're interested in in terms of nootropics are naturally occurring and you can get them by, you know, changing your diet. Would you say that you know, where, where do you land as far as like, it, does it make more sense to just change your diet and, and eat, you know, a little bit healthier in a number of ways and incorporate foods that, that already have some of these molecules versus taking supplements? Um, I'm not even sure where, where I stand there. The, the problem is that um, the reproducible effects that change your mind are usually there only if you take it not necessarily in isolated form, but at very high doses. For example, acetylcholine, which is, I don't know, present in broccoli and so on. But I don't think you can eat as much broccoli as to affect the, as to produce the nootropic effect. So some of them, you can, you cannot even uh, get enough from natural compounds. Another problem I see with that is that the density of nutrients in our food is like decreasing. Over the last decades, more and more, uh, I think it has to do with the soil having less nutrients, soil being reused, monocropping. But I know for a fact that vegetables that we buy in the supermarket today have only maybe a third of the nutrients that vegetables used to have like 50 years ago. And, it, you know, the trend is, is getting worse. So it's actually difficult to get all the nutrients that your body needs just out of food, which is for me a good argument to to take in supplements and even more so if you're talking about like brain enhancing stuff like i don't trust the food from my supermarket enough to provide me with all the nutrients how about you how do you do yeah. do you do supplementing uh you know i've gone kind of back and forth on it over the years i've i've tried it for for fairly appreciable amounts of time here and there to you know, subjectively not noticing significant effects. And then usually just due to the cost, I'll, I'll drop off and, and stop taking it for, for a while and won't really notice anything uh, too significant. Um, so so I'm, I'm really not the, the best example as far as that goes. Uh, I mean, I, I feel like I get most of what I need from, from what I eat. Uh, these days, I really don't supplement very much. Um, and, and one other aspect that I've, I've kind of personally experienced um, to a pretty, uh, you know, pretty uh, noteworthy, I guess, degree is just how significantly uh, things like exercise contribute to these things. Like, so, for example, for me, the, the thing I was referring to is I went to this, um, this, I guess you'd call it a meditation retreat. It was a, a sadhguru thing called Baba Spandana. And, you know, some of the activities that we did there were like very, very intense exercise, like beyond what I would normally do. And it seemed to be one of the more significant contributing factors to, you know, I, I just had a really glowing experience. I mean, it was almost to the point of being psychedelic, but they also like put us through some pretty extremely vigorous exercise. And I, I think that that was a very significant contributing factor 
Um, they actually have done some some research that shows that some of those programs have been shown to like increase brain drive, uh, BDNF brain drive neurotrophic factor pretty significantly. Um, and I, I definitely felt something. I mean, for several days after this program, I felt like I was, you know, on something that, that just made me feel really good, really outgoing, really social. And it seemed like the bulk of the effect was from just very intense exercise. So I'm kind of kind of curious what what your thoughts are as, as far as like exercise's role in, in all of this. Yeah, um, I think that even exercise or even exercise like meditation, uh, yoga, and so on. I think we can also think of them as nootropics, right? Because if we if we mm -hmm. wanna um, if we just want to change of state of mind or create like brain uh, enhancing functioning, why? I mean, it doesn't have to be necessarily like supplements or food. I mean, to go even with a less extreme example, so I was always looking for mood-boosting substances. Turns out, really rigorous exercise is very mood-boosting, right? Um, so, so now this is maybe for me uh, at least like two times a week the go-to thing instead of taking supplement. You know, I'm gonna make sure to at least somewhat regularly exercise because I know it will produceably always put me in a good mood and a good. A state of mind, perhaps also being even productive afterwards. So I definitely uh, think that exercise uh, can can create these uh, these states. Perhaps even perhaps even like expanded states of of awareness, like you're describing. And to tie this back again to the placebo effect. So I mean, we know about the placebo effect, and we we know that it works like in a third of people, and we even use it to control studies so any like rigorous scientific study especially when testing compounds will always have a group that is given a placebo to control the study which means you know we scientifically agree across the board that like a third of people can just like produce effects just in their mind even if they if they're given like sugar pills um so it seems to me that you know almost everybody is capable of uh, modulating their experience internally and i think we just need to find like some people can do it ad hoc just by their belief and other people maybe just need other tools for example substances or they use re reproducible stuff like like meditation yoga and these things uh, and i think actually that we haven't researched that whole area not very much so i mean in the in the last couple of years like With the uh, with the rise of uh, Wim Hof and ice bathing and breath work, I think now we're starting to speak about this. Like, how can we modulate um, and reach specific states? But I have the feeling it's it's still a completely new field. Although there's like traditions which have been doing it for like hundreds of years or thousands of years, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, I guess the way that I approach so much of this is I just kind of experiment on myself. You know, I mean, let let the science lead you to to some degree, but also just, you know, if, if something seems to work for other people, I'll probably give it a try, you know, even if there's not a lot of research backing it. Um, so that's, that's generally been my approach and seems, you know, fairly effective, I think. Um, in terms of safety for example so we kind of touched on this as far as their the body could potentially develop uh, dependency on some of these uh, substances we're talking about in general um what what do you think about the safety of neurotropics i mean i know it, it's going to depend pretty significantly on on which particular one we're talking about i mean maybe you're talking about something like caffeine Uh, obviously fairly safe-ish at, at lower doses, um, but also you can definitely overdo it. I mean, I had a friend who <laughs> was taking a bunch of caffeine pills in high school and ended up having a, a fairly minor heart attack when he was a teenager, right? So you can overdose just about anything. Yeah. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on safety? It's really hard to speak like uh, in general terms. I mean, Each, yeah. each of these substances have their own risk profiles. Just to give you an example, like alpha GPC, which is an alpha brain, there has been one study which linked it to like a higher risk of stroke. Hmm. So, you know, and then, so for each 
And then there, there's like some some things you can counter it with. And I think it's also something that the people from Onit considered. So they try to kind of manage risk by supplementing with other things in, in the same stack. But that just to, to say that each compound has its own risk profile and there is, you know, you need to do your research. And then when we're talking about stacks, again, there's like very little research uh, around combinations of, of compounds. So I'd say, honestly, I think nootropics is a field uh, which is uh, pretty dangerous, actually, if because you're you're playing. <laughs> I mean, with your with your, with the help of your brain at the at the end of the day. Um, however, I think there's people who are willing to to take those risks, and I personally don't have anything uh, against it. But I also want to make people aware that um, you know it's it's not all flowers uh, and roses, um, except maybe adaptogens. Like this is really the, the only category of, of, of uh, nootropics where I could either say, you know, add it to your stack, like, uh, or at least try it out for, for a couple of weeks. I, I, I really think it produces like a nice effect and has like very low risks or no known risks basically. But uh, these other things um, are a bit more dangerous. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I mean, as as with anything that we're talking about here, don't don't trust us. You know, do do your own research. You know, uh, go check out some forums, see what other people's experiences are. That's usually my my source of information for for a lot of these topics in general. Uh, very cool. Um, yeah. Anything else that you want to touch on on, on this topic? Um, I think we didn't touch on. Yeah, maybe CBD and uh, and nicotine. Although I have the feeling that those are really more um, more commonly known. I mean, I have the feeling that CBD was really discussed in detail in in the last five years with all of these CBD products coming out. Um, but yeah, just want to mention that CBD also falls in the category of nootropics, uh, of a compound that produce that rep- that produces always. Um, a calm state of the nervous system and in turn also uh, the mind. So we can also think of it as a, as a nootropic. A little bit less known is um, that nicotine is actually a, a nootropic, although s- smokers will probably intuitively know this, but um, nicotine is actually really good for um, concentration, for example, um, longer periods of concentration um, nicotine and tabak is also used uh, in endogenous cultures and in shamanic rituals there's like a really long long history to it and i can personally vouch for its effectiveness however i really have to stay away from nicotine because i was addicted to cigarettes uh, for a long time and um maybe maybe that's also a good thing to to mention when we talk about nootropics uh, today like some of these things work that well that you know they're dangerous just because of their addictiveness and i think nicotine falls under that category and i see really a rise of new nicotine uh, products so there's uh, nicotine pouches there's nicotine gums one of them that has uh, become popular in the in the us is called neurogum um and it does work but um i promise you um if you are a person with addictive tendencies, I recommend to stay uh, uh, away from it because while it has like a nice effect, I don't think it's it's worth it. Like you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes sense. Makes sense. Yeah. So so for folks listening, maybe it makes sense. You know, if you want to get into this world, maybe you're trying to work with with your mood, or your depression, or something. Maybe it makes sense to start with sort of the the safer end of the spectrum, and and you know. Add, add in some exercise, maybe take a look at your diet, you know, and then then start slow, start simple. You know, if you want to get into the nootropics, uh, like Nick was saying, maybe start with like the the adaptogens. I think that's pretty, you know, safe, safe area to go for. You have any sort of last thoughts on like, you know, if somebody's listening, they want to get into nootropics, what would be your sort of like a uh, quick elevator pitch for start, start this way, do this? Um, I'd recommend everybody to look into adaptogens. They are not expensive. They are accessible everywhere. They produce really good effects. They can help you deal with stress. They can help you deal with stressful periods in your life without putting yourself at uh, any risk. 
And other than that, I definitely agree and say that first check if um, you're eating the right food, if you're getting uh, enough of the nutrients through your normal food and um, first check if you're getting enough exercise because I, yeah, almost none of the nootropics that we discussed today were more effective for me personally in producing a good mood than exercises. So, so I think that's a, it's a good conclusion. Cool. Well, that sounds like a, a good spot to end it. Good place to wrap it up. Awesome.